So my name is Khalil Kota. I am Director of Education at the New Haven Museum. And it's been a privilege to be able to, to be part of planning our, our younger viewers, our, our kids storytelling. Um, um, I think it's an inspiration point and I'm happy to have everybody here. Um, this is the 26th annual celebration of the Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King legacy of social justice. It's morning, everybody. Welcome to being a teacher. Um, <laughs> legacy of social and environmental justice. Um, it's an honor to welcome you all on behalf of the New Haven Museum, the Martin Luther King Planning Committee um, with the OP body, and we're so grateful. Now with me today, um, that I couldn't do this without every year, we're so happy, uh, is, is one of our educators, um, Rohana De Los Santos, and so she's going to be walking us through our presenters and helping us today. So um, say hi, Rohana. Hi, everybody. My name is Rohana. I'm a teacher in New Haven and an educator at the New Haven Museum. It's so wonderful to be with you guys this morning. Um, so I, I think it, it's, it's, it's great to have everybody here. I think we're gonna run a little bit over. We are gonna run close to 12 o'clock. So I know we had said um, uh, till 11.30, but our storytellers did such a wonderful job. We didn't wanna cut anything. So you're getting a full presentation just like we would at the museum. Um, so we're really happy to have that. Um, I think we want to talk a little bit about our partners and our sponsors, Rohana, if you want to. Sure. So we want to celebrate and appreciate the many organizational partners and sponsors who have made this year's celebration possible. Um, so thank you to our founding partners, the LP Body Museum and the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Um. Yeah, no, it's, it's been great to work with the Peabody too. Like the Peabody has been a great partner in this for years. Um, and it's great that the New Haven Museum gets to kind of add a little something extra. I think that's a really good piece to kind of, you know, switching it up and, and keeping the community involved in it and keeping other organizations as well. Absolutely. Um, in addition to that, uh, if we're ready for the next part, uh, the Peabody's 26th annual celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy of social and environmental justice, it's a mouthful, is generous, generously sponsored by citizens with additional support provided by the Office of the Secretary and Vice President of for University Life and Belonging at Yale. And then just a little bit of, of kind of making sure that everybody that kind of came in or if, if you weren't here, if you were streaming, um, we have closed captioning is available for this program. Uh, Features can be accessed through the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen. Um, any questions during the program, please feel free to um, use the chat um, or the Q&A feature. And uh, let us know if there's any problems or anything, or if you just want to say anything. Or, or again, praise, praise for our um, presenters is, I think, a fabulous thing um, because they, they put in a lot of work this year um, in some hard circumstances. So, so we're really excited to have them here. <clears throat> we got people from North Carolina, um, Santa Fe, New Mexico, wow. uh, lots of people. So we've got a lot of, lot of people. I think I'd uh, rather be there right now. So I'm jealous of you all. <laughs> it's raining here and it's icy. Um, and we also have a uh, short video from our sponsor from Citizens Bank. So I just want to get to that real quick. Um, let's just get that up. Hello, and welcome to the 26th annual celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy of social and environmental justice. I am Katie Soares, Vice President of Public Affairs for Citizens. Citizens is proud to be the presenting sponsor of the Yale Peabody Museum and the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environment's celebration of the life and legacy of Dr. King. The anniversary of Dr. King's birthday is a time for all of us to reflect, to learn and to apply those learnings to today's challenges and to renew our efforts to honor his legacy. At Citizens, we serve our customers, colleagues and communities to help them reach their full potential because when we do, families are stronger, businesses grow, communities prosper and economies thrive. We are thrilled to bring you this series of free online programming for you and your families to hear from some environmental justice leaders making a difference in our communities. 
From all of us here at Citizens, we hope you are enjoying the wonderful programming throughout the weekend. Will, you're, you're um, on mute. I think there we go. Okay. Still have technical issues. <laughs> Um, before we get started, um, I know we have, we also wanted to do our land acknowledgement. So um, I want to make sure that that um, is part of our presentation because I think that that's a very important part of, of the programs that we do. Um, so Yale University acknowledges that Indigenous people and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket, Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoat, Golden Hill, Pogasset, Niantic, and and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these people and nations and this land. Um, Thank you, Julio. Can I go ahead and jump in? Yeah, I mean, I, that's what I think they're here. They're not here to hear us like banter back and forth all morning. <laughs> I think they're here to see some entertaining storytellers and, and fun stuff. So I think that that's, that's what they're here for. Okay. Um, so welcome, everyone. I see that you're coming from all over the place. I see North Carolina, Boston, Florida. Uh, did we say Santa Fe, North Carolina, Baltimore? Um, another Florida. So welcome. I'm sure we have plenty of people from Connecticut too. You can say it. You're also from Connecticut. Okay. Um, Iowa, New York. It's wonderful. Um, so one thing that I think brings us all together is that <clears throat> we're here right now. It's, it's uh, MLK Day. Happy MLK Day. And for those of you with little ones at home, it's been a really, really rough beginning of the year. Okay. Um, my toddler's uh, watching from the other room. And I know that we really need programming like this to, to give ourselves a break, to allow our students to learn, okay? So you have my full permission, and for those of you who didn't hear at the beginning, my name is Rohana De Los Santos. Um, you have my full permission to go get a cup of coffee and come back to this program. And kids, you're gonna have a wonderful time watching this today. Um, we're gonna laugh together, we're gonna dance, we're gonna learn, okay? Um, forgive me, I have like three screens going at once. Uh, so we're going to have a good time. Uh, so uh, we will be moving eventually, but at first we're going to warm up, wake up, watch some stories, um, listen to some songs, etc. cetera. Um, we're going to have a nice time together. Okay. We're, we're going to do some art too. There's some, we're going to do some, some art too. Yes. Yeah. We're going to do some paint. art. Yeah. Um, so get ready. Uh, the day will become a little bit more interactive as the morning goes on here. Uh, but at first it's okay if you're still in your pajamas. Okay. Uh, not for us. We can't be in our pajamas, but you kids can still be in your pajamas. All right. So first up, we have Miss Waltrina Kirkland Mullins, um, who is a teacher in New Haven, Connecticut, and she is a storyteller for many years now. I hope that we have um, students who are in her class that are watching us today. I expect that we do. Uh, she's a phenomenal teacher. Um, she will be reading... Mr. Lincoln's Way by Patricia Polacco and All the Colors of the Earth by Sheila Hamanaka. So without further ado. Hello and welcome. It's so wonderful having you join us for this year's Martin Luther King Day celebration. This day is special because it reminds us to remember the efforts of Dr. King and others across cultures who fought and continue to fight against social injustice while promoting environmental equity for all. It also reminds people across cultures to celebrate and respect one another as valued members of American society, regardless of one's nationality or racial background. Many would think that by now in the year 2022, I can't believe it's the year 2022 already that most Americans would believe in Dr. King's dream that we embrace people solely because of the content of their character. Unfortunately, as held true during the tumultuous civil rights era, many people continue to judge one another based on skin color, 
believing that one race or group of people is better than another. Truth is that if we could remove the skin from every human being on planet Earth, we would find that beneath the surface, we are all the same. You see, the concept of race or differentiating people by color is a crazy and untrue concept, one used to create a divide between diverse people. So what can we do to counter that? What can we do to make America a culturally inclusive, better place to live for all? Well, today I'm going to read a story to you called Mr. Lincoln's Way. I love this book. And Patricia Polacco is the author. Make sure you get all of her books. But we're going to read this book and perhaps find out a solution to this problem of the racial divide. Are you ready? Let's dive in. But before we do, look at that cover. Look at that cover. You see diversity there, don't you? Let's see what happens. So here we go. Mr. Lincoln's Way. Mr. Lincoln was the coolest principal in the whole world, or so his students thought. He had the coolest clothes, had the coolest smile, and did the coolest things. He had tea parties with Mrs. West kindergarten every spring. He took Mr. Bliss's sixth graders on nature walks in the fall. He set up his telescope next to the pond in back of the school on special nights and invited all the kids in the neighborhood and their families to come and look at the stars. And in the winter, like this time of year, he was Santa for the Christmas play. He lit the menorah for Hanukkah, wore daishiki for Kwanzaa, and a burnous for Ramadan, if Ramadan took place during this time of year. Mr. Lincoln was just plain cool. And there he is. You see how cool he is? Well, absolutely everybody thought so, except Eugene Esterhaus. Mean Gene is what everybody called him. Mean Gene sassed the teachers and beat up on most of the other kids on the playground. He was no student at all. He drove Mrs. Dunkel crazy in English. Miss Chu wanted to drop him from art. And he was a bully with a capital B. He always seemed angry, picking on kids and calling them names. He's not a bad boy, really, Mr. Lincoln said only a bit troubled to just about everybody though in that school eugene was trouble with a capital t there he is there's there's mean gene can you see him there he is then one day he leered at a first grader what you looking at scumball he said and pushed her down and wrenched her backpack away. I'm going to tell Mr. Lincoln, she announced. Go ahead, you little brat. I ain't afraid of that. Nick. Ooh. He used the word that rhymed with bigger, but you better not say that word because it's a word that denigrates people. I'm going to tell Mr. Lincoln, she announced. Go ahead, you little brat. I ain't afraid of that. Then he stopped. Mr. Lincoln was standing right there. The bell rang and Eugene scurried away. Now Eugene was in Mr. Lincoln's thoughts more than ever. He knew he had to find a way to reach that little boy. Then one day as Mr. Lincoln was helping the fifth grade plant a tree in the beautiful new atrium, he noticed that Eugene was looking up into the branches of one of the other trees. There sat a bright red cardinal. Those kind of birds are in our neighborhoods around here. There's the cardinal right there. See it? Beautiful red bird. And two other days, Mr. Lincoln had seen Eugene standing at the atrium window, watching birds on those tree branches. Mr. Lincoln wondered 
was it possible that I don't know what Mr. Lincoln is up to, but I'm sure he's up to something. Well, it wasn't a day later when Mr. Lincoln called Eugene into his office. Eugene slumped into a chair. Mr. Lincoln took a beautiful book out of his desk drawer, a book in blazing color and all about birds. He turned to one page and studied the illustration. I've got these little birds all over my tree and I don't know what they are. Eugene got out of his chair and walked closer. Those are red cap nut hatches. We're to see them this time of year. You seem to know your birds, Mr. Lincoln said with a warm smile. I do. When I lived with my grandpa on his farm, he had tons of birds around, chickens, thrashers, meadow larks. We raised carrier pigeons together. You've got quite a grandpa, Mr. Lincoln said, but Eugene just turned his back on Mr. Lincoln and left that room. That little boy had a manner problem there. A week had gone by when Eugene ran into Mr. Lincoln by the atrium, looking glum. I have a problem, Mr. Lincoln said. So what of it? That atrium was supposed to be full of birds, but they're just not coming. The principal looked into the empty atrium. Wrong plants in there to make them want to stay. Not the right food either. Eugene started to walk away. Your grandpa teach you that? Eugene turned and looked at Mr. Lincoln for the first time. Maybe he did. Do you suppose you could help us attract birds here to our atrium, Eugene? Mr. Lincoln handed him a book. And perhaps this would help. Eugene seemed stunned at first. Then he took the beautiful book on birds in his hands, wrapped it in his arms, and bolted down the hall. Do you think something might happen? Mm, let's see. As the days passed, Eugene never seemed to be without the book. His English teacher let Eugene read passages from the book in class. I'm so pleased to see him reading, Mrs. Dunkel exclaimed. And when he didn't have his nose in that book, he was almost constantly out in the atrium. He and Mr. Lincoln made a list of plants and shrubs to buy and types of grain and seeds to feed the birds. They even built three feeders together. It looks like some kind of change is starting to happen. Hmm. That's when it started. The strange thing started to happen. The birds began to come. Nut hatches, bluebirds, a tanager, and many colored finches, so many different kinds that the whole school stood from time to time just to watch the wonder of them all in the atrium. Eugene seemed genuinely happy. He didn't even tease the other children anymore. Look at that. Wow. Then one day, Miss Chu burst into Mr. Lincoln's office there are two mallards nesting in the atrium. See that mallard? It's a duck, you know. Mr. Lincoln rushed to the hall, and sure enough, there in the atrium were a male and female mallard, and there was their nest near the southeastern corner of the atrium. Mr. Lincoln saw Eugene on the other side of the atrium giving him a thumbs up said, yeah, baby, the birds are in here. You know what I'm saying? He was just like that. I was hoping that they might be a mating pair, Eugene said once, as he and Mr. Lincoln looked at five perfect eggs in the nest. Just one problem. The ducklings will need to be near water. They'll need to go to the pond outside. They can't fly out of the top like their parents. You'll think of something, Eugene. I know you will, Miss Lincoln said. And he put his hand on Eugene's shoulder. It was nice that mean Gene wasn't so mean anymore. That's some amazing things happening there. Wow.
but it was only three days later that there was a commotion in the hall. Mrs. Belding rushed into Mr. Lincoln's office with Eugene in tow. Mr. Lincoln looked at Eugene in disbelief. What happened? I'll let Eugene tell you, Mrs. Belding trumpeted, but Eugene said nothing. He just sat looking hateful and defiant. Trouble in the lunch line, she went on. He singled out two of our students from Mexico and he called them brown skinned toads and other unacceptable names like that. I'll take care of this, Mr. Lincoln said quietly. Mr. Lincoln sat down in front of the boy. Eugene, Eugene, look at me when I'm talking to you. My skin is brown too. Eugene just glared at Mr. Lincoln. This I know, Eugene. Someone who loves birds the way you do couldn't possibly have that kind of hate in his heart. Then Eugene began to cry. But, 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 but my old man got real, real mad when I got home late from helping you, he sobbed. He said, you're not our kind. You're not our kind. Our kind, Mr. Lincoln murmured. He led Eugene to the window of the atrium. It was alive with the songs of the birds. I see sparrows and jades, cardinals, nuthatches, and even the mallards. Don't all of those beautiful types and colors make this a beautiful place to be for all of them? Eugene nodded. Yes, yes. Well, God made all of them, all kinds, just like he made all of us, Eugene. Fact is, all of you children here in this school with all your cool differences are my little birds. Yes, my little birds. And that should be your answer as to what is right or wrong and what your father said. Mr. Lincoln sat quietly and so did Eugene. But my old man calls you real bad names, Mr. Lincoln. He's got an ugly name for just about everybody that's different from us. Mr. Lincoln didn't talk for the longest time. Eugene, sometimes people get trapped in their thinking almost as surely as those ducklings will be trapped in that atrium, Mr. Lincoln said thoughtfully. My grandpa just wasn't like that. Mr. Lincoln put his arm around the boy's shoulder. I'd like to meet that grandpa, but Eugene, Eugene, son, you have to promise me, even when bad things happen at home, here in this school, you need to treat all of my little birds with the kindness and respect that I expect from you. No more teasing and no more name calling. Please promise me that, Eugene. And Eugene crossed his heart, his finger up in the air, promised. Well, Eugene was good to his word. He became a model citizen. He tried with all of his heart to keep his promise to Mr. Lincoln. Then one bright morning, Eugene stopped at the atrium window the eggs, the eggs were starting to hatch. He ran from room to room and brought the whole school to watch. The ducklings were hatching one by one. At first they were wet and unsteady, but in a short time they were fuzzy and racing about. And there they are. As the days passed, the mallard parents flew out of the atrium landing on the pond just behind the school. They were leaving their babies for longer and longer periods of time. Eugene and Mr. Lincoln knew that the time was approaching when they would need to get the ducklings out of the atrium into the pond. They had a plan. When the big day arrived, Classes were asked to stay in their rooms. Then Eugene and Mr. Lincoln opened the door to the atrium and stepped in. They had both practiced saying, rah, rah, like the mallard parents. 
Now they talk to the ducklings, coaxing them to follow. The father mallard waddled up to the doorway of the atrium and peered down the hall. At the end of the hall, the father mallard could see the lawn and the pond. <coughs> Eugene called. And the mother mallard came out first. Then one by one, her babies followed. Eugene walked down the hall, calling to them over and over and over again as the family waddled behind him. Then all at once, the mother and the father took the lead and the ducklings scurried after them. At the outside doorway, they stopped for a moment. Then the mother and the father mallard jumped out of the doorway and coaxed each of the ducklings to follow. Look at that. Wow. Mr. Lincoln and Eugene both stood and watched as the ducklings raced down the hillside and plopped into the pond with their parents. Now I know where the expression like a duck takes to water comes from, Mr. Lincoln laughed. He couldn't believe how well the baby swam. Uh-oh, I can't show you what's going to happen here. I'm not going to show the page. I'm just going to read this. Parents had gathered at the top of the hill. They had been invited to watch from afar. Then Eugene heard a voice from behind them call out his name. Eugene, Eugene boy, over here. Who do you think it was? It was his grandfather. The boy raced up the hill. Mr. Lincoln joined them both. This is my grandpa, this is my grandpa, Eugene sang out. I know it is, Mr. Lincoln said. Eugene turned toward Mr. Lincoln. Had Mr. Lincoln something to do with this miracle of his grandfather being there? Now the old man shook Mr. Lincoln's hand heartily. I would sure like to stay with you again, Grandpa, Eugene said, as he and his grandfather walked up the hill together. The old man put his arm around the boy's shoulder. We'll see, son. We'll sure see. And there he is with his grandfather. Well, later, Eugene and Mr. Lincoln walked down the pond together. Eugene needed to say something to Mr. Lincoln. You showed those ducklings the way out, Eugene, Mr. Lincoln said. You really, really showed them how to get out of that atrium. Hey, you showed me the way out, Mr. Lincoln, Eugene smiled. Then he stopped and looked into his principal's eyes. I'll make you proud of me, Mr. Lincoln. I promise I'll make you proud. And there he is looking at Mr. Lincoln. Now I'm not gonna read the very last sentence on this page, but what I am gonna do is hold this page up and I want you to look closely at that picture. And if you look, right down under here for this little girl there's a sign and it says room seven grade four mr esther house did mean gene keep his promise yes he did wow i don't know about you but one thing i noticed in this story was that a grown up had race prejudice in his heart and taught it to his child. And oftentimes, racial discrimination is passed down from one generation to the next. It is my hope that all of you little people who are in hearing distance of this presentation will be the movers and shakers of tomorrow and change our world and teach everyone to learn to respect and celebrate one another 
in this great nation of ours. So before we bring this session to an end, I just want to share one more work with you. I think it's real important because I believe that children will make the difference. And this is called All the Colors of the Earth by Sheila Hamanaka. And I think it is the perfect way to end this presentation. This is a poetic work. And I want to see if you agree with what's contained herein. Children come in all the colors of the earth. The roaring browns of bears and soaring eagles. The whispering golds of late summer grasses. and crackling russets of fallen leaves. The tinkling pinks of tiny seashells by the rumbling sea. Children come with hair like bouncy baby lambs. Or hair that flows like water. or hair that curls like sleeping cats in snoozy cat colors. Children come in all the colors of, of you and me. For love comes in cinnamon, walnut, and wheat. Love is amber and ivory and ginger and sweet. Like caramel and chocolate and honey and bees. Dark as leopard spots, light as sand. Children buzz with laughter that kisses our land, with sunlight like butterflies, happy and free. I'm so excited about this book. I don't want to come to the end of it, but here we go. Children come in all the colors of the earth and sky and see. I hope you enjoyed our presentation for today. And I hope you remember that we can make the difference in the world. And truly love knows no color. Let's embrace Dr. King's philosophy of learning to embrace one another with love, looking out for one another, and being the best we can be. Thank you so much for sharing with me today. All right. Um, thank you for uh, Miss Waltrina and to anyone who is just joining us now. Um, that poetry was beautiful. Yes, we come in every color and so does love. Um, kids, don't forget that. Okay. Um, next up, we have Miss Joy Donaldson, um, who has been here before. Uh, she is a retired New Haven teacher and a longtime storyteller, and she will be sharing with us Martin Luther King Jr. in word and song. Rohana, I just wanted to add, um, yes. all of our storytellers did their thing in their own space, mm -hmm. and I'm really excited that Joy was able to come in in between things as, you know, 
things have happened this year and, and closing the museum and to visitors and things, Joy was able to come in and actually do her presentation in a museum space. Um, so the first time in two years we've had that. So I'm, I'm really excited to show that um, in our Strange Time exhibit. Um, it's a photography exhibit put together by a photographer, uh, Ron Topping. Um, and so, the, you know, Jason uh, bischoff Orsel, our director of photo archives, and I agreed that it was a really nice space to do that. So you'll see Joy in an actual museum space, which I thought was really important for, exciting and important for this. So I'm really happy to see that, so. No worry, kids, we'll get back to the museums before we know it. Um, so enjoy at least visualizing it for now, okay? Um, so again, Joy Donaldson, everyone. Greetings and hello. Let's tell the story of in word and in song. Chapter one. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hill and everywhere. Go tell it on Stone Mountain. That once upon a time, a boy was born to a couple in Atlanta, Georgia, the son of a minister and the grandson of a minister and the great grandson of a minister. They named the boy Mike Jr after his father. But when his father, Daddy King, changed his name to honor the dying request of his father, the son also changed his name. And Mike Jr. became Martin Luther King Jr., the man whose birthday we celebrate today. When Martin was young, he was smart and worked hard in school. He was so smart that he skipped two grades. He was only 15 years old when he entered Morehouse College. Chapter two. Get on board, little children. Get on board, little children. Get on board, little children. There's room for many or more. The fair is cheap and all can go. The rich and poor are there. No second class upon this train. No difference in the fair. Martin traveled by train for several summers to his summer job here in Connecticut, up in the area near Bradley Airport. It was as he got on the board that train that he first experienced integration. Living in Atlanta, he was used to the system of segregation, whereby the laws required that there be a separation of blacks and whites in the South with separate colored and white schools, separate colored and white bathrooms, separate colored and white drinking fountains, separate places to ride on buses and trains, separate places to eat and for sitting in movie theaters. Getting on board in Atlanta, he had to ride in the colored car, the first car behind the old time engines. It was a car where the dirt and soot and heat from the engine flowed straight back into the colored car. But when it got to Washington, D.C. and changed trains for the one to Connecticut, he could ride anywhere on the train that he wanted. While he spent time on the weekends in Hartford, he wrote to his mother about what it was like to enjoy integration, to sit where he wanted to, that he could eat in a restaurant, any restaurant, and sit anywhere he wanted to, and where he could actually try on clothes before buying them, which was not allowed in Atlanta. But when traveling back to Atlanta and home at the end of the summer, he again had to change trains in Washington, D.C., and go to sit in the hot, dirty, sooty 
colored car. Chapter 3. Go preach my gospel, saith the Lord. Bid the whole world my grace receive. He shall be saved who trust my word, and he condemned who'll not believe. Martin followed his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather into the ministry. And while working on his doctoral degree in Boston, he met the talented Coretta Scott, who was studying to be an opera singer at the conservatory. And when school was ended, they returned to her home in Alabama, where they married. But you know, when you're getting married, you need a job. And in 1954, he got the job as the minister at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. Chapter 4. I shall not, I shall not be moved. I shall not, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved. On December the 1st, 1954, Rosa Parks got off work and followed the brush routine to return home. So, she got on to the front of the bus, placed her coins in the coin box, turned around, got off the bus, walked to the back door of the bus, and got on and sat in the first row of the colored section. But the rule was that if the front white section of the bus filled up, then everyone in the first row of the colored section had to get up out of their seats and move further back in the bus. On that day, however, when the white section was full and a white gentleman got to the colored section, Rosa Parks said no to giving up her seat. Although everyone else in the row of seats did get up and move back. The bus driver was called and told her to move, and she respectfully refused. The driver then went for the police, who took her off the bus in handcuffs. This so angered the black citizens of Montgomery that they decided to again try to boycott the buses. Chapter 5. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. They called for the black community to meet at the Dexter Avenue Church, which had for a long time been a meeting point with their previous minister. And without Martin King present at the time, he was chosen to lead the Montgomery Association's boycott. Why would they choose a new minister to lead the demonstrations? Well, it was because he was a newbie, a newcomer, who did not have family there that the whites could threaten. And they couldn't get him fired from his job because he worked for the church. The organizer had learned from previous boycott failures what was necessary to be successful. The people needed to, one, know that there was going to be a boycott. So they quickly got flyers out into the black neighborhood. And the people in the community knew that they needed to have ways to get to work if it was too far for them to walk. So the organizers had made a list of those with cars who would be willing to give people rides to work. 
These things made this bus boycott successful where the others had failed. The black people in Montgomery walked for over a year until the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. changed the law so that people had equal rights while on public buses and trains. Chapter six. We are marching in the light of God. 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 We are marching, we are marching, ooh, we are marching in the light of God. We are marching, we are marching, ooh, we are marching in the light of God. From the 1950s to the 1960s, Martin and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference members marched for equal rights under the law. By 1963, Martin had been leading marches all over for justice and peace. And in August 1963, he led the famous March on Washington. With people getting together at the Lincoln Memorial, Martin was the last speaker to address the crowd that had gathered from all over the country. At that time, he started his speech which was titled, America's Has Defaulted on a Note, meaning that the United States had given black people a bad check, one that promised that all men were created equal and would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that change was needed. But during the speech, he heard Mahalia Jackson, the famous gospel singer, yell to him, tell them about the dream, Martin. Tell them about the dream. And it was then he poured out the I have a dream section of his speech. After the march on Washington, King continued to march for justice and peace and freedom and as a result, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Chapter seven. Upon the mountain, my Lord spoke. Out of his mouth came fire and smoke. Looked all around me, it looked so fine. I asked my Lord if it all were mine. In April of 1968, Martin went to Memphis, Tennessee to help the garbage workers win their rights. On the night before the march, Martin was not feeling well and decided to skip the rally where he was to speak. But the people there really wanted to hear him speak. So his companions had him dress and come to the rally to speak anyway. That night, he gave his I've been to the mountain top speech where he said, I've been to the mountain top. I may not get there with you, but we as a people will reach the mountain top. The next day, on April 8th, 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. Chapter eight. It's been much more than 50 years since Martin Luther King Jr. has been with us. We know that things are better for most African Americans, but we still have a way to go. We have seen over the past several years now how unequal many African Americans have been treated. But we still will hope that we shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. 
that we shall overcome some day. Thank you. All right, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed some song from Miss Joy. I know she can sing much better than I can, so I'm glad we were able to bring her on so I didn't have to sing for you guys. Um, so next up um, is for the artists in the room, and that means everyone, kids, we're all artists. Um, even the even the adults in the room, you're artists too. So join in. Um, you can all get something out of this next segment. Okay. Um, we are uh, visited today by uh, virtually by artist Anthony Gilks, um, who is based here in New Haven, Connecticut, where I am broadcasting from or nearby. Uh, and he will be sharing with us uh, teaching of kid-friendly painting. Uh, painting is very messy with the little ones, I know, uh, but hopefully uh, Anthony can share with us some tips um, to make it fun and organized in our homes, okay? Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Jilks, and I'm an artist and a creative force. And welcome to my studio. Today, I'll give you a quick tour show you some of my artwork, and then we'll work on a project together. But that's in just a bit. Firstly, I wanna say thank you to all of the organizations who have helped us honor the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. today. I'm excited and honored to be here and glad that you're joining me too. my studio where I work on most of my creative projects and if I'm not here I'm usually outside I'll go for a walk spend time in nature which I find very relaxing or you'll catch me reading a quirky book I'm very fortunate that I'm able to sing and create music definitely paint one of my favorite things to do and I hope that you find some space in your home in which you can be creative so that you have an outlet and have the opportunity to make art share a couple pieces with you that I've done over the last couple couple months. to make my artwork about the process and not the final product. Thankfully, it's been an excellent outlet for me, and I encourage you to get involved in art. Find a hobby or something that you can do at home during this time. Okay, thanks for joining me for my quick tour. I want to start painting, don't you? It's been a couple minutes already, right? To start, we'll need to protect the surface if we can. Also grab some paper, pencil, markers, crayons, paintbrush, and you can do this on a table or on the floor. So the first thing we're going to paint is a heart, because I think the world needs a little more love right now. I'm going to probably use a marker to start, but I'm going to set aside a couple colors that 
I'm going to use for the heart. You can use any colors you like or you can follow along. So I'm going to use a little red. And next I'm going to add a little white. And I'm just going to mix those two together with a tiny bit of blue. stir your color too if you haven't done it already or if you're using markers or crayons you can you know scratch in the corner or draw with your favorite color or colors I'm actually going to use a marker to guide us and you can do the same my heart's not perfect that's not what this is about it's for us to take a moment and create some art I'm gonna go right in with a pink And I'm being free, I'm not being very restricted, I'm just enjoying the painting. And I hope you are too. And just going to make this side a little bigger, give it more shape of a heart. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect at all. And, you know, I encourage you to make a couple of these because they're just fun to do and fun to have around. All right. So here's our first piece. It's something simple, something pretty quick. And uh, you know what? I think we should do another one. So this one, we're going to go pretty quickly, but I want you to start it and finish it when you know we're done with today's event. So I'm going to use a little bit of red, a little bit of white, a little bit of yellow, and this one I spent a little more time on making the heart because, you know, I may give it away to someone. And this one I am going to go a little bit slower. Video sped up, but uh, I am going as slow as I can so I can s try to stay within the lines. But it's not about perfection. It's about taking the time to enjoy doing some art. Great, and that's it. So go ahead and sign yours, add a smiley face or not, and give it away to someone you care about. Before we start this next exercise, I just want to let you know that there's no way that you can make any mistakes in art. I like to call them, you know, happy accidents. Maybe if I make a mistake or have an error, quote unquote, in my painting or any artwork I'm working on, it might lead me to something new. So for this exercise, I want you to find the middle of the page and we're going to draw the body of a butterfly. We're going to make like a little outside of a banana and then draw the top of the head and then kind of draw like the opposite outer edge of a banana a little bit. And then we're going to start with the wings. I'm going to extend my pen out to the edge of the page and then come down the page and then hook in towards the middle of the butterfly's body. remember you can't make any mistakes so sometimes I'm not that great at drawing and I really don't judge myself for it I just enjoy the moment so we're gonna draw the left wing come down a little bit then hook in towards the middle of the body and it's totally okay for using pen or pencils right now or feel like painting this and remember, we're going to finish this later after the event, so you have something to do. We're going to go ahead and draw the next part of the butterfly's wing on the left side. And I'm going to go ahead and speed it up so you can see what I did. I just went with a couple lines, little squigglies. 
and then I went with that same wavy line at the bottom and then I decided to use a couple different colors to fill in different parts of the wings of the butterfly. You can be completely free here in the colors you're using and it's there's no judgment so if you're feeling like you want to make this all blue or all yellow or all red or mix a variety of colors to make your own you totally can but I'm deciding to make little sections like on the butterfly's wing and then fill it in with different colors in different areas and hopefully you're drawing in some of the lines on your right wing and remember you don't have to keep up and in this section I decided to color in the green a little bit more on the left here and if you notice the color is really popping so if you want to add some more detail to it you can color in a little more with, with whatever item you're using to paint or, or a pencil etc. In this next section feel free to paint whatever you'd like. I'm gonna do something that's kind of abstract and use a technique that I like So here's the paint I'm going to use. Today the colors that are speaking to me are the following. I'm going to use a little bit of red, maybe a little bit of green, and maybe a little black today. And what I like about this technique is that there's really no rhyme or reason. I'm just going to drag the paint across the paper and see what I can come up with. Here we go. this one I'd like you to paint whatever you'd like. I'm going to go ahead and use the technique I was using before. So I'm going to pick a few colors that I really like right now. So I've got a little bit of blue, some paint left over from some other things I was working on today. A little bit of purple too, some red. I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit of white too because I know that uh, looks good and helps the color lighten up. Next I'm going to go ahead and take the card and just press it gently against the paper and just drag it until I get just about to the edge of the page but leaving a little bit of room. And then I'm going to flip the card and match up the red and then pull back across the other way. And this is another painting that I'd like you to start. And from here you can add any details that you like. I think I'm just going to get rid of some of the paint here and see what I can come up with. That's it. Right in your own home, you were able to create two pieces of artwork. The first was a butterfly with lots of colors, and then we made a heart with our own custom color. 
you can use art to express how you feel, connect with other people, and, you know, make gifts. So if you feel like it, or if your heart is telling you to do so, after you create something, definitely sign it, and then share it with a friend or a family member. One more thing. Remember that you can use the tools that you have at home to create anything you want. Don't limit yourself on what you can create. Be safe, be kind, and remember to be creative. Thanks for spending the time with me, and I'll see you soon. Take care. All right, everyone, um, welcome back. Thank you again to artist Anthony. That was wonderful. Um, I love the idea of, of um, introducing abstract art to kids. That's fabulous. So um, parents and, and kids, if you weren't able to get through your, your, your artwork in the last 15 minutes or so, you have the rest of the day. And this is a wonderful activity to do at home if, for our kitties when they have to, if they have to quarantine again in the next few weeks. So keep, um, Watch out for this video. It'll be posted um, to the Yelp Body uh, YouTube channel. I think I just saw in the in the chat window, um, and uh, you will have access to that in the future. Um, also, feel free to share your art with us at New Haven Museum or the Yelp Body. Um, you can share. You can tag us on Facebook um, or other or Instagram. Um, we would love to see your artwork, and we would love to also share it um, with Anthony um, Gilks uh, so we can see what you guys put together. Um, so, next up, now that my phone has uh, gone, gone black here, give me a second. Next up, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Clifton Graves. He is a New Haven probate judge. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, know who he is. Um, and he is sharing with us the chicken and the eagle, in addition to his own story of the effect of Dr. King. Without further ado. Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Clifton Graves Jr. I'm serving as, I serve pre presently as probate judge for the District of New Haven. And I'm here to share a couple of stories about in the commem commemoration of Dr. King's uh, birthday and his legacy. As I recall, I was a child of about nine years old living in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, my, my hometown. And uh, my parents had decided that it was important for me to attend this event a church, a church program on a Wednesday night, Wednesday night. Um, and they kept imploring me that it was important and it was something I would appreciate and remember the rest of my life. So we arrived at the church, the uh, Gola Memorial AME Zion Church on a Wednesday night. Place was packed, the church was packed. Um, mostly African American, but there was a sprinkling of whites there as well for this great event. The church was so packed, so full, that the only seat for me was at the piano stool near the front of the church. So my father placed me there and, um, and I just waited in anticipation for this event um, that it was about to take place. Um, my father had told me that there was this great preacher, this young preacher from Georgia that was coming to speak. That was important for me to hear. So the great anticipation, the preacher arrives and it's, begins to speak um, to a standing ovation, of course. And um, I can't recall much, but what I do remember was that this preacher um, said things like, well, he was saying like he was talking to us, the young people in particular, to me in particular. And he said things like, well, you know, to, to work hard, study hard, strive to be the best you can be. Uh, things won't always be like this and you have to be prepared and be ready for the changes that are about to come. He said, and I think he, I remember him saying something like, well, 
If you can't be a tree, be a bush. If you can't be the moon, be a star, but always strive to be the very best at whatever you are. And all these years later, I, I remember those words. And at the conclusion of this great preacher's sermon, um, because he received again a stand, another standing ovation, my father grabbed me by, came down and grabbed me by the hand, and took me up to the podium there to shake the hand of this little preacher, this great preacher from, from Georgia. And of course, this was none other than the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And um, all these years later, uh, I think about that night in the, the Golden Memorial AME Zion Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, when my father and my mother had the wisdom and foresight to bring me along to, to, to make sure I understood and appreciated the significant, the historic significance of that moment and to have me hear him speak and to be able to shake his hand. And of course, it was years later as I grew older and began to appreciate and understand the significance of that night and the significance of this man and what he meant, um, what he stood for and how his life all these years later continues to impact on my life. Um, as, because um, clearly that night among other incidents that happened throughout um, my, my, my growth and maturity, um, hearing Dr. King speak, shaking his hand as he going to college, um, to law school, to being involved and engaged and civically and politically as I have over these last uh, over 50 years. And even now serving as a probate judge, the first African-American probate judge in the city of New Haven. Um, I reflect back on Dr. King, meeting Dr. King, hearing him speak, being inspired and motivated by him. So today, or this weekend rather, as we commemorate what would have been his 93rd birthday, 93rd birthday, gosh. Um, I'm reflective and, and certainly um, appreciative of, uh, of that night, the significance of that moment in my life and how that night continues to impact on me to this very day. And I think it's important for all of us, particularly in, in these difficult trying times that we, we're living in now with the, all the political turmoil and the racial and social and sexual uh, injustices that continue to take place in our, in our, in our society. Um, it's important for us, I think all of us, to reflect back on Dr. King's life and his legacy, um, not just on his dream, because I think I say this often, that Dr. King was not, oftentimes I think he's mischaracterized as being a dreamer. No, he wasn't a dreamer. He was a visionary. There's a difference. He was a visionary, a visionary, one who had a, 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 a foresight and, 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 and wisdom and saw the world, began to see the world differently than we see it now. He was a change agent a difference maker. And that's the vision that we need today, all of us need today, as we continue to fight and challenge the injustices that, that we see and witness every day. And I think, so this is, I think the significance of Dr. King's weekend for me personally, and my, my, my personal sort of reflection and experience that I had that still impacts on me to this very day. But more, more importantly, um, as I share with those who are listening, the the importance for all of us to incorporate that vision, to incorporate that, 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 that spirit of being a change agent, a difference maker. I think it was Gandhi who said that we must be the change that we seek. And Dr. King quote, also quoted Gandhi. He had a chance to meet Gandhi as a young man. And I think that and Dr. King and Gandhi, the great Gandhi inspired and motivated Dr. King, among others. So it's important that we reflect on those we meet, those we encounter and incorporate those, that vision that challenge in our lives every day. You know, we, we can't do everything. We can't save everybody, but everyone can do something. All of us, each of us can do something. Each of us can be, a, can be a difference maker and a change agent first in our own lives and then in that, and, and hopefully in that of others. So again, I say happy birthday, Dr. King. Happy birthday, Dr. King. Thank you for your life, your legacy. Um, and let us continue to, to all of us continue to fight and to challenge and to be the change agents that, that we need to be and be difference makers that we all need to be to make America. As Langston Hughes once wrote, let, let us continue to fight to make America the land it has not yet been, but yet must be. 
the land that has not yet been, but yet must be. And I think that certainly was um, incorporated the division in the spirit of Dr. King. Amen. So there's an African parable that tells the story of uh, the chicken farm, the chicken farm, the man was a chicken farm. All he did his whole life, uh, all he known his whole life was raising chickens. His grandfather had been a chicken farmer. His father had been a chicken farmer. And here he was now, part of his legacy, chicken farmer. Well, so one day chicken farmer happens to venture out uh, from his village and he sees this huge egg in the middle of the road. Now, again, he's a chicken farmer, so he knew something about eggs, and he also knew this was not a chicken egg. This was a big egg. And so, but he also knew that there was a life inside that egg. If he left it out there in the middle of this road, some animal or some person would come and crush the life inside. So, again, being a chicken farmer, who knew something about eggs, he picked up the egg and brought it back to his farm and put it in the barn and let it incubate. Well, well two weeks later, Egg incubator, egg hatches. And lo and behold, there's a baby eagle inside the egg. So the chicken farmer said, oh, gee, you know, I'm just a chicken farmer. All I know is how it's raising chickens. I don't know a doggone thing about eagles, but it's a bird. So I'll put it out here, put this little baby eagle out in the field, in the yard here with the other chickens. And I treat it like the other chickens. I feed it like the other chickens. And so, you know, we'll see what happens. Well. That's what happens. He begins to feed it and treat it and talk to the eagle, just like the other chickens there in the field with the um, the field that he uh, that he had. Well, about a month or so later, a stranger happens to come to the farmer's land, and by now the eagle begins to take on eagle characteristics. You know, beak, wing spread, clearly distinct and distinctive from the other chickens, all the other chickens there in the in the, in the on the farm. So the stranger happens to notice this one eagle in the midst of all these chickens. And he says to the farmer, excuse me, Mr. Farmer, but why is it that this one eagle is out there in the midst of all these chickens? So the farmer tells him the story. Listen, man, I'm, I'm in the yard one day. I mean, I'm, I'm venture out from the village one day. I see this egg in the middle of the, of the road. And if I left it there, it would have been crushed and killed. It would, the life inside it would have been crushed and killed. So I brought it back and let it hatch here on the farm. And lo and behold, it's a baby eagle. So yes, you're right. That's an eagle. Clearly distinct from these chickens, but... I raised it and taught it and treated it like the chickens. So while he looks like an eagle, he thinks like what? A chicken. So the, so the stranger said, well, Mr. Farm, you should be commended for saving that chicken, that, that eagle's life, but that's an eagle. God made that eagle to fly and to soar and to take his rightful place on this earth. So while you should be commended and thanked for saving the eagle's life, you're doing that bird a disservice by keeping him down here with all these chickens. And the farmer said, you may be right, but I did the best I could. So the stranger said, let, let me try something, if you will. Uh, the farmer said, go ahead. He said, let me take the eagle up here on in the, in the tallest tree here on your land. Let me see if I can work with him. So the stranger did. The stranger puts the eagle on his arm, climbs into the, into the, into the, uh, up to the tallest tree there on the farmer's land, and he whispers to the eagle's ear, fly, eagle, fly. Soar and take your rightful place. And no sooner than he said those words, that old chicken farmer threw down some chicken food, chicken feed, and that eagle flew straight back to the ground and started picking up the chicken feed like the other chickens, like chickens do. The farmer said, I told you, man, no matter what you do, no matter what you try, I know he looks like an eagle, and he is an eagle. He thinks like a chicken. The stranger said, let me try something else. So once again, the stranger put the eagle on his arm, climbed on all to the top to the top to the roof of the barn the tallest building there on the farmer's land and once again whispered into the eagle's ear fly eagle fly god made you to fly and soar and take your rightful place and no sooner than he said those words that old chicken farmer threw down some more chicken food some more chicken feed and that eagle went jump off the stranger's arm straight back down to the ground and started picking up the chicken feed like the other chickens farmer said i told you man no matter what you do, no matter what you try, that eagle will always think like he's a chicken because he's been raised to think. He's been socialized to think. I brought him up and taught him every day that he's a chicken. So he thinks like a chicken, looks like an eagle, but thinks like a chicken. 
So then the stranger just said, well, maybe that's the problem, Mr. Farmer. All this eagle has known his whole life is this chicken farm. Let me take this eagle away from this environment. Let me take him up to the mountains and to the hillsides where eagles learn how to be eagles in his own environment. Huh? I mean, let me try that, please. So the farmer said, I don't care what you do. No matter what you try, that eagle will always think like he's a chicken because he's been raised to think like he's a chicken. And the farmer, the stranger said, we'll see. So the stranger blindfolded the eagle, put him on his arm and took him off the farmer's land, out of that environment, up into the hills, into the mountains, not far from, from, from the farmer's village. And day in and day out, day in and day out, the stranger would instill into the eagle's head, listen, you are an eagle. God made you to be an eagle, to fly and to soar and take your rightful place. Nothing wrong with chickens. Chickens are fine. You know, I like chickens. You know, I like jerk chicken. I like fried chicken. I like uh, chicken cacciatore. Yeah, but chick, you are an eagle. You are an eagle. You are special. So day in and day out, day in and day out, Week in and week out, the stranger uh, had to instill, kept instilling into the eagle's head, into his psyche, to his mind, that you are special. You are an eagle. You are an eagle. You need to learn on the fly and, 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 and soar and take your rightful place on this earth. So finally, the day of reckoning came. After about 30 days, 30 days of working with this eagle and to trying to de de deprogram him, if you will, from, from the chicken mindset that he had. That the, that, the, that the farmer had instilled in him all these months. The, the day of reckoning came. So the, the stranger took the eagle, again blindfolded him, put him on his arm, and stood on the edge of the, the, top, the tallest hill there in the village. And once again, whispered into the eagle's ear, Eagle, now it's your time to fly. Your time to soar. Take your rightful place on this earth. And he snatched the blindfold <clears throat> off the eagle's eyes, Threw the eagle off his arm, and, and initially, the eagle began to fall down, down the side of the hill as if it was going to crash. <clears throat> but halfway down that hill, the eagle began to stretch out his wings, stretch out his wings, and, and, and began to feel could fly, and, and that he could soar. And he was truly an eagle, a truly an eagle, that's destined to take his rightful place on this earth. And he got his confidence. He flew back up to the top of the, to the, to the hill there. He thanked the stranger. Then he flew over the chicken farmer's land and he winked at the chicken farmer and all the chickens that he had grown up with and then flew off into the sky, into the clouds. Finally realizing for the first time in his life, he was truly an eagle. He could truly fly. He could truly soar and take his rightful place. Well, so you ask, well, what's the moral of the story? Well, here's the thing. In this society today, and historically in America, and especially during this weekend, we honor the great Dr. King and his legacy. Far too many young people, particularly young people of color, have been taught and told and brainwashed into thinking, socialized into thinking, they're just a bunch of chickens. Chickens walking around with their heads down, right? Heads down. As opposed to understanding and appreciating the eagle that's inside of them. Far too many of our young people in our, in, on, on the street corners, in, incarcerated, even in schools, have chicken mentality, but have eagle, they have eagleness inside of them. And our, cha our task, our challenge is to try to bring out that eagleness. You know, but they've been socializing to thinking they're chickens. They can't accomplish anything. You know, your daddy wasn't nothing. Your daddy was a chicken. Your mama was a chicken. Your grandpa was a chicken. That's all you ever be. Our job, our task. Right? is to instill in our young people the eagleness, the, the, the sense of eagleness, bring out the eagleness inside of each of them. In fact, indeed, in each of us, even as adults, some of us still have chicken mentalities. So we have to figure out a way to bring out the eagleness, find that eagle, because eagles, eagles become doctors and lawyers and engineers and teachers and educators and presidents, huh? computer technicians, entrepreneurs. That's what eagles do. That's what eagles become. And we have to instill in our young people, especially, that and we have to find ways to bring out that eagerness in each of them so they can achieve and be the best they can be. They can soar and fly and achieve all that they are destined to achieve. And that's the moral of that story, the chicken and the eagle.
defined, especially on this day, this weekend, when we honor Dr. King, because Dr. King was an eagle, clearly. Malcolm X was an eagle. They can, Constance Baker Motley was an eagle. And we account the Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, eagles. And that counted, I mean, millions upon millions of people, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner True, Martin Delaney, W.B. Du Bois. Eagles, eagles. So let's, let us be committed to instilling our young people to understand, to understand and appreciate and help, to help them find that eagerness inside of them so they can be the best they can be and do the best they can do. The eagle within us is a beautiful message. Um, <clears throat> and as a teacher, um, I, I find it so very true. Um, but sometimes the hardest thing to get over with a student is their belief in themselves. Um, so don't forget that there's, you have that ability within you and you have to remember that each and every day. Okay. Um, so we are coming to the end of our program this morning. Um, it has been a joy to be with you all. Um, and for the sake of time, Khalil and I have decided that we should probably say goodbye now. Um, any last words, Khalil? I, I just want to say thank you for taking time out of your morning today um, and doing the work with us. I, I think it's one of the highlights of the year for me. Um, and I want to thank um, our director, Margaret Ann Tagashewski, for supporting the work that we do in the education department um, and giving us the ability to kind of diversify and reach um, a lot of different audiences. And I think that that's important in the work that we do. So, um, and, and the whole staff at, at the Peabody, um, Jesse and Hannah and Chris and everybody else behind the scenes that, that have helped us kind of put this together. And of course, all of our presenters have done such a wonderful job. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to you and, and, our, and our sponsors uh, at Citizens Bank and, and, and all our community partners. Um, we appreciate it. So I'll turn it over to you, Rohana, to introduce our last performer and, and let it go. Fabulous. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but after, now that I've, I'm, I'm warmed up now, I have my coffee, it's in my veins. Kids, hopefully you didn't have coffee, but hopefully you do have your natural energies, okay? <laughs> um, and I'm ready to dance. I'm going to, you know, go to my other computer streaming downstairs and dance with my son um, to the next part. So um, we have one last performer. So uh, please, everyone, come into the room ready to move. Um, we have performer Hanan Hameen. Um, who uh, is put on an amazing performance last year? I loved it, um, and she brings another one, and, and her and her fellow dancers bring another performance to us this year. Um, it's an interactive dance performance and lesson for Miss Hanan's Dance and Beyond. Enjoy. Ms. Hanan Hameen, founder and director of the Arts Education Academy Network, Ms. Hanan's Dance and Beyond, and keepers of the Culture Performing Arts Company. And today we present to you our interactive performance and classes. So join us, the Acro Rollers and the Asiko family from Senegal. And we have for you some dance classes. Join us, get up, have some fun, spread out, and follow along with us. And then after, stay tuned for our wonderful, wonderful pre-recorded performance that we have for you, featuring music by Brother Brian Jarawa Gray. Thank you. Stay tuned. I am the slave that runs through the night. I am the suspect that was nowhere in sight. I am the dream that my ancestors had. I am the child without a dad. I am the thug, love for me, no one has. I am El Haj Malik El Shabazz. I am Martin, Marcus, and Kruma, and Turner. I am Harriet, Winnie, and the truth of Sojourner. I am the queen from African times. I am the girl that welfare gives a dime. I am the African king that ruled with strength. I am the man that is on the road for death. I am the king, Rodney, Martin, and Don. I am the people the cops turn the hoses on. I am 
Momia Abu-Jamal. I am the people struggling not to fall. I am the witness, Christian, and Islamic community. I am the people without any unity. I am the community that doesn't own any stores. I am the man who calls himself a mm, and his woman a... I am the N-word who wouldn't obey. I am the Negro who still has no say. I am the colored that has no rights. I am the black that yearns to be white. I am the African American who thinks they're included. I am the African mind free still uprooted. I am Kunta Kinte who finally returned home. I am the African on earth first to roam. I am the one who built a pyramid with a step. I am the multi-genius Imhotep. I am the queen mother of the earth. I am Eve to Adam. She had to give birth. I am the village that it takes to raise one child. I am the question, why are our children running wild? I am three-fifths of a man you thought. I am the strength and intelligence you sought. I am the lost generation that has yet to be found. I am the father that searched for a job but was turned down. I am the blind that can now partially see. I am we. I am we. Welcome. Today I'm going to teach you a few of the dance moves that you will see in our performance. So spread out, give yourself some room, put your arms out, make sure if you're dancing with your family, make sure that you're not touching each other. Good. And bring your arms up, deep breath in, and let it out, and deep breath in, and let it out. Now we're going to do our isolations and tilt your head from side to side. And these isolations that we're doing, you're going to look right and left, loosening up the neck. These isolations come from the Dunham technique. Mama Catherine Dunham, she's one of our pioneers of black dance, our matriarch of black dance. And the principle of her technique is isolation. That's where we get jazz dance. It's also where we get a lot of our hip hop. Comes out of Dunham technique. Yes, yeah, so rotate the neck. And rotate to the other side, reverse. Now move your shoulders up and down, up and down. And double time. And triple time, shake, 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 bounce, 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 bounce. And move them front and back, and front and back. Really loosen up those shoulders. And now we're gonna alternate. And double time. And triple time, shake it, shake it, shake it. And the whole body, shake, 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 shake. And freeze. Now we're gonna move our rib cage front and back. And front and back, and front and back, front and back, and now side to side. Now we're going to circle slowly front, side, back, side, front, side, back, side, and reverse front, other side, back, side, front, side, back, side, and all the way around. And reverse, away. Now we're gonna bend our knees and move our hips. And now front and back. Really loosen up that lower back. Now we're gonna go around. And reverse, around. Stand up straight. Now we're going to bend our knees, plie, straighten, releve, and heels down. Plie, straighten, releve, heels down. Plie, and straighten, releve, heels down. Plie, and straight, releve. Put the feet together. Plie, and straight, releve, heels down. Plie, and straight, releve, heels down. Plie, and straight. Releve, heels down, plie, and straight, releve, heels down. Now open your feet in a nice second, arms out strong, straight, and we're going to do some 
squats, energize our hamstrings and glutes and quadriceps. Tighten your abdominals. And can you stay down and hold? Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. And Now we're gonna come up and lift the leg. And down and lift. 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 And, and shake it out. Now we're going to stretch. Flex your foot. Reach forward. Make sure the back leg is bent. Knees going over the toes. And stretch. And if you can, place your hands on the floor and make the foot flat and strengthen. Be sure to, to breathe and bring the feet together and switch legs. Flex the foot, then the leg again. Make sure it's going over the toes and then breathe and place your hands on the floor if you can. And place the foot flat, straighten both legs, and breathe. Feet together, and slowly roll up. Check it out, and we're going to do 10 jumping jacks. Ready? Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine and ten. Whew. Breathe. Deep breath in. And let it out. Deep breath in. And let it out. So, the moves that you're going to see today, they come from different dances from different regions across the African diaspora. So, some of the dances come from Guinea, some come from Mali, and some come from Senegal. So I'm going to show you a few that you're going to see repeated in our performance. So, our first step, make prayer hands, yes? And they're right at your chest. And bend your knees, the same we did in our warm-up, and you're going to take your right foot back. Back. Step one, step two, step three, left foot back. One. Two, three, and one, And let the shoulder, the same way as we did in the warm up when we circled our shoulders. Right. Yes, that's our first step. Our second step, we're going to reach up to the sky, up to the heavens, yes? And when you reach up, you're going to lift your leg up. On the both arms up. Up, Our first two steps. Ready? Five, six, seven, and. And we're going to go back. Two, three, four, and back. Two, three, four, and back. Two, three, four, and back. Two. Now we're going to go up. steps you're going to take your leg to the front and then to the side front side 
front and side, front and side, front and side, front and side. And your arms are going to go, bring it in to your chest, bring it out to the side, in, out, in, out. So when your leg goes to the front, your arms come in to the chest. And when the leg goes to the side, the arms go to the side. Ready? Let's try that. Five, six, seven, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's try it on the other side. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes? So that is our third step, front and side. Now, our fourth step, we're going to, after we go to the side, right? So we end here to the side, we're going to reach out, twist, twist. So I'm on the balls of my feet and I'm twisting, twist, twist, and let the hips move. And when you're twisting, your hands are here. And your hands are gonna go out, in, out, in, out, in, out, in. Yes? And you see I'm kind of leaning, right? In a slight diagonal. So as I twist, watch. Out, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, in. A little faster. So that is our fourth step. Yes? That's our fourth step. So, we're going to try all of that together. Our first step, remember, we go back. Back. Yes. Then we go up. Up. Yes. And then who remembers next? What's next? You got it. Front, side, front, side, front, side, front, side, and then the next side. Front, side, front, side, front, side, front, and side. And then what happens next? Right, you got it, twist. Yes? All right, let's try all of that together all four steps and then you'll be ready to dance with us when you see our performance ready all right ready to try it with me five six seven and back Stretch to the side. It's a nice cool down. And reach. Make sure you're breathing. Turn it over and flat back. And down over the leg. Breathe. Into the center. Other side. And up. And give yourself a big hand. Hello, my name is Mr. Ali. I will be presenting a short Africa dance combination. Here we go. So the first step is you're gonna go to your right knee. This is your right knee. So you're gonna go up, two, three. 
three, four, and five, six, seven, eight. So it's down stage, okay? So it's up and around. Five, six, seven, go. One, two, twist, three, four, and five, six, seven, eight. Next, right, two, three. Step, two, three. Right, two, three. Left, two, three. Circle, right. Circle, left. Circle, right. Circle, left. Okay? Let's do it with the music. All right? Yes? Let's go. Let's, let's dance. Hard. <laughs> to the side twice left right so it's left right left right okay so that's done eight times so it's one two three four five six seven eight so you can you can be flat foot or jump okay whatever you want after that is take it back two three four and five six Seven, eight, to the right. Two, three, four, and five. Six, seven, eight. So you're punching. All right, let's do it from the top. Let's go. One. of the Culture Performing Arts Company and Miss Hanan's Dance and Beyond. Stay tuned for our performance. Thank you for being with us today. Take care, stay safe.
Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your MLK day. Bye, everybody.